Today, we are discussing every Hashira, aka the strongest Demon Slayers in the history of Demon Slayer, all 13, including legendary former Hashira. We'll go over the secrets and powers of Water Hashira Gyu, Mist Hashira Prodigy Muichiro, Love Hashira Mitsuri, Strongest Hashira Gyome, and everyone else. So make sure to stay tuned for that, including ranking all of the Hashira at some point in the video. Smash that like button until you see fireworks if you like seeing Demon Slayer videos like this one and want to keep them coming. Make this the video you join the Demon Slaying fam if you haven't already by subscribing and hitting that notification bell to turn on all notifications so you don't miss future Demon Slayer videos and updates. Spoilers ahead. First, let's turn to the former Hashira, the people that ran the show before our current generation. First, let's look at Jigoro Kuwajima, the sensei or gramps of our boy Zanitsu. He is the former Thunder Hashira, and the actual title for a Thunder style using Hashira is Rumble Hashira if you didn't know. He retired from being a Hashira at the age of 35 when he lost his right leg from the knee down in the middle of a battle, as revealed in the first fan book. He was a master of the Thunder breathing style, and tried to teach all six forms to his students Zenitsu and Kaigaku. However, Zenitsu could only master the first, while Kaigaku could master the other ones, but not the first and found form. We get flashbacks of how he rescued Zenitsu from death and tried to drag an unwilling and whining Zenitsu back to training. He'd encourage Zenitsu telling him he had talent, and when he finally learned one form, Jigoro praised him and gave him the advice, if you can only do one thing, then do it superbly. Polish it to the utmost of the utmost. He'd knock Zenitsu on the head and tell him to forge a katana, you strike it and strike it and strike it to drive out the impurities and refine the purity of the steel. That's what makes a strong sword. He was so tough when it came to Zenitsu's training because he wanted to rid Zenitsu, the crybaby of his impurities, so he could become a blade that's stronger than any other. While others gave up on Zenitsu, Jigoro never did. He'd scold him over and over again. He would always pull Zenitsu back when he ran away. Even though Zenitsu said he went too far sometimes, the important thing for Zenitsu was that Jigoro never gave up on him. And Zenitsu himself realizes as early as the Mount Nataguma arc that thanks to his gramps, he grew strong so that he could now dream of helping people. Now you might be thinking if Jigoro had two students, who did he want to be his Rumble Hashira successor? Well, he wanted Zenitsu and Kaigaku to share the title, which seems fitting since alone they didn't know all the forms, but together they did know all the thunder breathing forms. How However, Kaigaku was insulted by this, thinking he's so much better than Zenitsu. When he crossed paths with Upper Moon 1 Kokushibo, he was quick to accept the offer to become a demon and eventually become Upper Moon 6. Jigoro, a man of honor, committed seppuku because the wielders of thunder breathing had produced a demon. As Zenitsu read in a letter, he died all alone and there was no second there to cut off his head, so he suffered in agony before dying. He didn't make it quick, even though he could have, because a student of his became a demon. Zenitsu gets more serious than ever after he reads this letter and starts preparing to avenge his gramps by taking down now Upper Moon 6 Kaigaku. Zenitsu greatly respected and loved Jigoro, and even told Kaigaku that he feels sorry that gramps had such pathetic successors. Ironically, Zenitsu, who Kaigaku thought was so far below him, actually defeats the Upper Moon by using his own created thunder breathing form, Form 7, Flaming Thunder God. Kaigaku thinks Jigoro favored Zenitsu and taught him that secret form. Form, but Zenitsu told him no, he created it and Jigoro wasn't that kind of person. After the fight, Zenitsu is temporarily close to death and sees Jigoro's spirit on the other side of a river. He apologizes for everything, for not paying off his debt, for not becoming a Hashira in Jigoro's lifetime, for being the reason Kaigaku turned into a demon and so on, but Jigoro just tells him with tears in his eyes that he's proud of him. Jigoro wasn't just a rumble Hashira, he also succeeded in helping to create one of the strongest swordsmen in Zenitsu, who went on to create the strongest form of thunder breathing yet. It's all the more impressive that Jigoro forged him from the crybaby he used to be. From crybaby to creating his own and strongest thunder breathing form, soloing an upper moon, and playing a big role in defeating the demon king of pop once and for all. So I think it's safe to say that his student Zenitsu more than made up for the disappointment of his other student Kaigaku. Next, we have everyone's favorite Hashira, former flame Hashira Shinjuro Rengoku. And yes, I'm being sarcastic. This dude is easily the most hateable of the Hashira despite being the epic Kyojuro Rengoku's father. When Kyojuro told him he became a Hashira, Shinjuro responded with no one cares. When Kyojuro died, Shinjuro said he was a worthless and stupid son. The first fan book even reveals he hates animals and that's why his children can't have pets. But it should be noted that Shinjuro's life has been a roller coaster ride 
ride and he wasn't always the short-tempered abusive drunk that he is during the main story. Kyojuro himself says that he didn't used to be like that. He became a Hasha with enthusiasm and even raised his children enthusiastically. But then he changed. There are a couple of notable reasons for this. One is that his wife Kyojuro's mother fell ill and died. Another is that he adopted a very pessimistic view of the world, namely that a person's capabilities and limitations are set at birth. A rare few enter the world with talent and the rest are just rabble with no value. He viewed himself and Kyojuro as being in the latter category. He loses it when he sees Tanjiro's Hanafuda earrings and says that he's a practitioner of sun breathing. He attacks Tanjiro and even though he's been drinking, Tanjiro can't help but notice that he's so fast and no amateur, a nod to how skilled he must have been as a Hashira. Eventually Shinjuro explains what he read from historic flame Hashira records, that sun breathing is the first breathing technique and the strongest. All other breathing techniques are nothing more than imitation lesser forms. When he read this, he started to resent users of sun breathing, thinking himself hopelessly inferior to them. He developed an inferiority complex that made it seem like there was no point to anything if you weren't one of the chosen few, a skilled user of sun breathing. However, even his own history disproves that. We find out that he saved Iguro from the female serpent demon. Iguro went on to become the serpent Hashira and although we don't know how many countless people he saved off screen, we do know that he goes on to play a crucial role in helping Tanjiro to defeat Muzan. So by saving him, Shinjiro in a way is to be thanked for all the good Iguro went on to do afterwards, just like Kyojuro is to thank for all of the good Tanjiro goes on to do after he saved him from Akaza. But Shinjuro is not as heartless as he seems at first glance, even in the present. Yes, he said those awful things about his dead son, but when he's alone, he bursts into tears, crying out his son's name. It becomes clear that in part, he didn't want to encourage his son in the past because he didn't want him to end up dead like this. We see an eventual change take place in Shinjuro after Kyojuro dies. In the past, he used to drink on the job before Kyojuro replaced him as Hashira. In fact, as we find out in Kyojuro's side story, because of his drinking, Shinjuro failed to finish off a dangerous demon that would eventually want revenge, get stronger, and become Lower Moon too. This demon recalls an image of Shinjuro who held and drank alcohol as he was fighting. He was way stronger than the demon at the time and diced his flesh and heart into pieces. He caused fear and rage in that demon, but left him alive. Fortunately, Kyojuro eventually finished the job, but who knows how many people suffered in the interval because of Shinjuro's drunkenness and failure to take his job seriously. However, in this side story, we see a flashback of Kyojuro telling his little brother that their father will pick himself up one day, and he does, but unfortunately, it takes the death of his oldest son to do it. During chapter 147, we see Shinjuro sober and helping out along with fellow former Hashira Tengen Uzui. They are serving as bodyguards for Kiriya and his siblings. Shinjuro even says, like Kyojuro, I will risk my life to protect them so as not to bring shame upon House Rengoku. So it's good to see that Kyojuro set such a good example that even Shinjuro eventually came to his senses and got back on the right path. Next, we have the former water Hashira, Sakonji Urokodaki, arguably the most popular former Hashira. He was Tanjiro's first mentor and the opposite of Shinjuro in many ways. Not just elementally, but in the fan books, it's revealed that Sakonji doesn't drink alcohol and has a very low alcohol tolerance. He also only makes fox masks because he likes foxes. So he likes at least one animal, unlike Shinjuro. Also, in a fan book, it's revealed why he wears a mask, which I thought was a pretty hype reveal. It's because demons used to make fun of his gentle face. We also learn that he receives money from Ubuyashiki, but never spends it on himself, preferring to live a self-sufficient lifestyle. He does use it to pay for nutritious food that he gives to Tanjiro, though. So all around, we already get the sense that Sakonji is a stand-up guy. He also shares similarities with the real-life swordsman legend Miyamoto Musashi. He described his style in the Book of Water, meditated in remote mountains in his older years, and also had a long line of students who met unfortunate ends. He also wrote the Book of Five Rings around 1645, which people still recommend as must-read self-development reading to this day. Now we actually get a bit of a parallel with Shinjuro when we look at Sakonji's backstory. Whereas Shinjuro seems to have let his demon survive through drunken incompetence, Sakonji purposely seems to have let the hand demon live on so that he could serve as one of the final selection obstacle demons. Because Sakonji captured him and imprisoned him there, the hand demon hates Sakonji and takes pleasure in killing Sakonji's disciples that make it to final selection. This demon killed 13 of Sakonji's apprentices, including Sabito and Makomo. 
Now let me know if there's a satisfying explanation for this, but this almost feels like a plot hole to me because of how stupid it seems when I think about it. If I was Sakonji, I would have killed the Hand Demon personally long before the number reached 13, or at least stopped making my students targets by giving them fox masks that the Hand Demon could use to identify and target his students. The only reason this could be seen as less bad than what Shinjuro did by letting his demon live is that at least people willingly enter the final selection exam knowing the risks, while Shinjuro's demon could have killed innocent people as well. But back to the story, Sakonji trained Giyu as well, a sign of his skill, since water Hashira Giyu is not only strong, but was skilled enough to create his own water breathing form, Dead Calm. Giyu is the one who asks him to train Tanjiro, and he does after Tanjiro passes his tests. We see that Sakonji is very skilled during Tanjiro's training arc. Tanjiro calls him ridiculously strong, and he easily beats Tanjiro in the beginning, even though Tanjiro has a sword and Sakonji is sparring unarmed. After a year, he tells Tanjiro he has nothing more to teach him. He insists that he needs to figure out how to split a giant boulder by himself before he will approve Tanjiro's entrance into the final selection exam. And I assume we all get why he wants to make sure Tanjiro can do something so insane before entering because he doesn't want yet another apprentice to die at the hand demon's hands. In fact, Sakonji even says he had no intention of sending Tanjiro to final selection and seeing another child die. Sakonji thought he he wouldn't be able to split the boulder, but when he does, Sakonji, a guy who could be violent to Tanjiro during training, tenderly pats him on the head and says he did well. He calls him an amazing child and tells him to go to final selection and to return alive. Then of course he gives Tanjiro a fox mask because he says it protects people from evil, but again, in my view, it more so makes him a hand demon target. All the while, Sakonji has been taking very good care of Nezuko, and he continues to do so when Tanjiro goes off to the final selection. Of course, when Tanjiro comes back from final selection, Sakonji is overjoyed. He group hugs Tanjiro and Nezuko with tears running down the side of his face, saying he's glad Tanjiro came back to them alive. When Haganezuka comes with Tanjiro's sword, both he and Sakonji Sakonji hope Tanjiro's sword will turn bright red, from the get-go only for it to turn black. Sakonji lets Tanjiro know that he gave Nezuko subconscious suggestions to defend humans from demons as if they were her family. Now already, Sakonji seems like a good guy, but this becomes even more apparent when we find out that he sent a letter to Buyashiki asking him to forgive Tanjiro for harboring a demon and promising that if Nezuko ever killed a human, he along with Tanjiro and Giyu would commit seppuku to repent. In other words, the dude is willing to risk his life to help Tanjiro and Nezuko. Later, while Shinjiro is protecting Kiriya, Sakonji is protecting Nezuko, a prime target for Muzan. Once again, he's risking his lives for these kids. In the extended Demon Slayer ending, we even see Sakonji take off his mask, once the world is at peace again and the demon threat has been dealt with. But at the same time, the mangaka only shows us the lower part of his face, which wears a gentle smile, wanting to keep the mystery of his entire face alive for us, even while the characters in Demon Slayer would now know what he looks like. And it's fitting that he takes it off and can celebrate this new peaceful world with his students barefaced because if you'll remember he only wore the mask to begin with because of demons. Next we have former flower Hashira Kanae Kocho, the older sister of insect Hashira Shinobu, and if you didn't know, the love interest of wind Hashira Sanemi, as we'll get into. Kanae and Shinobu lived a peaceful life with their loving parents before a demon attacked. The demon took the lives of their parents and was about to take theirs before they were saved by the strongest Hashira Gyomei Himejima. After this, they decided to become demon slayers in the hopes that they could prevent others from experiencing what they experienced. Later, at Sanami's first Hashira meeting, she was present. Sanami was mad, thinking that Ubuyashiki only viewed demon slayers, like his friend who died, Masachika Kumeno, as pawns. It was Kanae who stepped in and told him that that wasn't the case. Ever since he became their leader, he memorized all the names and backgrounds of the core members who died. That was a little clue that these two specific Hashira would grow closer. In a fan book, Yomei would later reveal that Sanami seems to like Kanae. Furthermore, Kanae was also important to Kanao's life. The Kocho sisters saved Kanao from a life of poverty and enslavement. They took her to the Butterfly Mansion, adopted her, and named her Kanao. Because of her trauma, she couldn't make her own decisions, so Kanae gave her the coin she used to help her make her own decisions. Furthermore, Sanami reveals that he talks to Shinobu now and then since she's Kanae's little sister. Clearly, he wants to make sure she's okay since she was so important to Kanae, and Kanae was so important to him. However, unfortunately, Sanami and Kanae didn't get their happy ending because Upper Moon 2 Doma entered the picture one day. 
Upper Moon 2 Doma was understandably too strong for her. Although he couldn't eat her in time because the sun came up, he did mortally wound her. Reminiscing about her, he commented that she was kind and cute. Although Kanae wanted Shinobu to live into old age, Shinobu insisted on getting revenge, so Kanae reluctantly described Doma, the demon that took her life, to Shinobu. This set about an epic story of revenge, one of my favorites in anime, that would eventually lead to Doma's downfall, and we'll get into that when we talk about Shinobu. Notably, Doma did praise Kanae's skills, telling Insect Hashira Shinobu that she doesn't have her older sister's talent. Notably, Kanae's sister Shinobu poisoned Doma, while Kanao, the girl she adopted, finished him off using Kanae's own style, flower breathing, albeit Kanao had some help from Inosuke. So like the other Hashira in this list, Kanae's legacy continued to help the Demon Slayer core long after her passing. And now let's move on to the Hashira that are Hashira during the course of the main story. Next up we have younger Kocho sister and insect Hashira Shinobu. It's easy to underrate Shinobu because she is the physically weakest Hashira, so much so that she can't even cut off a demon's head, so she had to utilize poison in her fighting style. However, that poison led to one of the greatest victories in Demon Slayer over the overpowered Upper Moon 2 Doma. I think Shinobu's revenge arc is a masterpiece, I must say. As mentioned, Doma did remark that Shinobu wasn't as talented as her older sister, and she is one of the few present Hashira that didn't get a Demon Slayer Mark power-up, but still, Doma did praise her during their fight. He comments that Shinobu is very, very fast. In fact, he says she may be the fastest Hashira he's ever met. So being fastest among not just the other Demon Slayers, but the other Hashira he's encountered is definitely high praise. Shinobu's insect breathing move, Hundred Legged Zigzag, is especially impressive. She weaves around in all directions in an advance that destroys the bridge beneath her feet. Doma even remarks that he can't predict her attack. She comes in from below and pins Doma to the ceiling. Of course, that doesn't finish off Doma, and he ends up absorbing her, but even that's part of Shinobu's amazing revenge plan. She's been consuming demon poison for a long time so that she could deliver more poison to Doma than she ever could deliver through a sword. I love patient and well-planned out strategies like this. In the end, the poison kicks in and allows Kanao and Inosuke to finish Upper Moon 2 Doma off. And it really did make all the difference. Even like this, they barely managed to do it. However, without the poison, Inosuke and Kanao would have had their hands full with even the Upper Moon's ice clones, let alone the Upper Moon himself. So props to Shinobu, her intellect and knowledge of poisons allowed her to help take down one of the strongest demon moons. Yes, it cost her her life, but she got the job done and it was arguably the most satisfying upper moon defeat in the entire series. Next, we got Sound Hashira Tengen, who retires after his fight against Upper Moon 6, Gyutaro and Daki. He's also one of the few modern Hashira that don't awaken the Demon Slayer Mark power-up. Despite how flashy of a ninja he is and how many wives he has, Tengen is just not as strong as most of the Hashira on this list. He played a vital role in the defeat of Upper Moon 6, but lost his hand and eye in the process. Even Serpent Hashira Iguro calls him out for this, saying, What are you going to do about losing your hand and eye in a fight with mere Upper 6? Implying that Tengen should have dealt with this demon easier, and that Iguro and most Hashira would have. In fact, Tanjiro is the one who finally cuts off Gyutaro's head, and Zenitsu Inosuke, Nezuko, and even Tengen's wives all played roles in this fight. In contrast, 14-year-old Mist Hashira Muichiro, as we'll get to, soloed a higher upper moon and made it look easy after he awakened his Demon Slayer mark. Still, praise must be given to Sound Hashira Tengen for his bravery and manliness. The dude doesn't even make a big deal of losing his eye and hand. And even after retiring, as mentioned, he comes back with Shinjuro to protect Kiria and his siblings. As with Shinobu, it should be noted Tengen also relies on more than just a sword to fight. In addition to his dual Nichiren cleavers, he also uses explosive beads in battle. These small black beads explode when cut and are capable of harming the bodies of even upper moons. Next, let's look at Mitsuri the Love Hashira. Just as Tengen's sound breathing is derived from thunder breathing, Mitsuri's love breathing is derived from flame breathing. In fact, Kyojo Rengoku was Mitsuri's mentor and taught her flame breathing before she developed her own unique style. There are a lot of unique and interesting things about Mitsuri. Her green socks, to start with, were given to her by Serpent Hashira and love interest Iguro. Her hair is considered a weird color in the Demon Slayer world and not just normal colorful anime hair, as we might assume. Furthermore, her whip-like sword is very unique. We're told it's extremely thin and flexible. The speed of her technique surpasses even Tengen Uzui's, the narrator tells us, and this is before she awakens her Demon Slayer mark. 
We're told her impressive speed is thanks to not only the flexibility of her katana, but also her own flexibility and incredible range of motions. Her katana is difficult to use and liable to cut anyone else who wields it. It was made just for her, a weapon which only she can use. Not only is Tundra impressed by her speed when she joins the fight against Hantengu, the Hatred clone is also impressed by her. He launches an attack that should have left Mitsuri in pieces, but she has a special constitution. In other words, her physique belies or misrepresents her muscle density. She's called the Eightfold Girl because her muscle density is eight times that of a normal person. So her slender arms should look very jacked like Tengen's in terms of how much muscle power she has, but they don't because of her constitution. In other words, the mangaka made her super strong while keeping her looking very cute. Although Mitsuri was quite impressive during this fight, it's later made clearer that she is one of the weaker Hashira as well. When Iguro, Gyome, Sanemi, Giyu, and Mitsuri are fighting Muzan together, Mitsuri is having the most trouble. She says she can't see Muzan at all. She's relying on intuition and luck to dodge. She predicts that she will be the first one to fall, and her prediction is correct. She's the first one to be taken out of commission, and Iguro rushes in to get her out of further harm's way. Even though she dies as a result of the Muzan battle, along with Iguro, they do get their happy ending as reincarnations. And seeing them married and running a family restaurant together is definitely one of the highlights of the final chapter for me. Next is Flame Hashira Kyojo Rengoku, who as mentioned actually mentored Mitsuri. Before Demon Slayer marks, I'd say he was one of the strongest, but unfortunately he never awakened his own Demon Slayer mark, so we can only imagine how strong he would have been if he did unlock it. As mentioned, Kyojuro became a Hashira when he beat the demon his father didn't finish off. That demon went on to become a lower moon too, but Kyojuro was still strong enough to finish what his father started. However, Kyojuro Rengoku's most impressive fight was definitely against Upper Moon 3 Akaza. Keep in mind, a Demon Slayer mark awakened Gyu, and the Hashira or beyond level Tanjiro barely managed to stop Akaza. And part of that, as we'll get into, was because Akaza chose to stop fighting. Yet Rengoku without a Demon Slayer mark almost beat Akaza. Now yes, this does make Rengoku look good, but in all fairness, this statement needs to be placed in context. Tanjiro and Gyu were fighting in the Infinity Castle, where there was no threat of sunlight. In contrast, Kyojuro used the Rising Sun to his advantage during the Akaza fight, as we'll get into. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. From the beginning, Akaza is impressed by Kyojuro. He can tell Kyojuro is strong by looking at him and comments on how he developed his fighting spirit to the edge of perfection. In fact, he's so impressed that he wants to turn Kyojuro into a demon desperately. He even says that Kyojuro worked so hard to build such magnificent talent. Akaza further comments on his amazing speed and wonderful sword technique. This is all very high praise coming from such a strong demon. Kyojuro uses his strongest form, flame breathing ninth form Rengoku, which translates to purgatory. In the anime, this attack even takes the form of a dragon, which if you follow my videos, you know that I believe attacks that take the forms of dragons are especially strong in the Demon Slayer world. When the dust settles, Akaza seems to have the advantage. He's given Rengoku a mortal wound through the body with his one arm. However, Rengoku uses even this situation to his advantage. Even with pierced guts, he summons what Akaza calls unbelievable power. He grabs Akaza's other hand, while the one that pierced Rengoku is stuck inside still. The dawn is approaching to the panic of Akaza. Rengoku's sword, meanwhile, is making its way through Akaza's neck, slowly but surely. Finally, Akaza's only option is to tear off his arms and run away in a panic, before before he can even finish off Rengoku. Although Rengoku dies and Akaza lives, Tanjo has a point when he says that it's Akaza's defeat and Rengoku's victory. After all, Rengoku's goal was to protect everyone else, and he succeeded in doing that. Considering how close Akaza was to his end here, it's likely that if Rengoku awakened his Demon Slayer mark, like the others would go on to do, it would have been enough to at least take Akaza down with him in this sunrising scenario. It's not that hard to believe that that massive power-up would have been enough to keep Akaza there a few more moments until the sun came up and did the rest. Alas, Rengoku didn't awaken it, but to me what he did accomplish convinces me that he would have been even stronger than Demon Slayer Mark Giyu if he awakened. After all, even without a Demon Slayer Mark, Rengoku was arguably even more impressive against Akaza than Demon Slayer Mark Giyu, even though the Water Hashira had a Hashira level or beyond Tanjiro there with him. Now yes, Rengoku had the Rising Sun, as I keep pointing out, which is important to note, but still, it's equally important to note that without a Demon Slayer mark, he was able to hold Akaza and start cutting his neck until the upper moon ripped off his own arms in a panic and ran away. It's such a shame we never saw Demon Slayer Mark Rengoku because I'm sure he would have been beyond legendary. Next, let's turn to Water Hashira Giyu, who is known for not smiling and having no friends, as Shinobu likes to point out. But as we saw during Sakonji's part, he's a really good guy, who would put his life on the line for Nezuko and Tanjiro promising to commit seppuku 
Nezuko, along with Sakonji if Nezuko were to ever kill a human. Even though I believe Demon Slayer Mark and Goku would have been even more impressive, that doesn't mean Giyu wasn't impressive in his own right. We all remember when the Water Hashira came in and absolutely embarrassed Lower Moon 5 Rui, after Tanjiro and Nezuko were having so much trouble. Granted, this was early in the series, but Giyu looked so untouchable and overpowered at this point. He even showed his own personally created form, 11th form, Dead Calm. It's almost like a glimpse of the more overpowered selfless state Tanjiro will later awaken. For this 11th form, Giyu ceases body movements and enters a state of complete tranquility. It looks like he's doing nothing because of how imperceptibly fast he is, but he's actually deflecting, blocking, and cutting any incoming attacks. Using this, he completely nullified Rui's attacks and made it seem like he wasn't even trying, like he didn't even do anything. But this is no ultimate defense as we'll see soon. Now let's jump to the Akaza fight where Giyu finally gets pushed to his limits and beyond. Akaza compliments Giyu's developed sword technique, saying it's wonderful. But then, he sends the water Hashira flying with his kicks. Very far away, we're talking through multiple walls, it takes Giyu quite a while to rejoin the fight. However, when he does, he realizes that for the first time in a long time, he's up against a strong opponent who overwhelms him, and he realizes that his senses have been sharply honed in a short period of time. He explains, senses that were closed off to him have been awakened and dragged out to the place where my strong opponent stands. Now he understands how the intense struggle to survive increases one's skills. This is a flex in and of itself where he's pretty much saying he didn't for a long time have to try. The demons that he encountered were easily dealt with, never challenging him whatsoever. But now, thanks to Akaza, he's awakened the Demon Slayer mark. Akaza immediately notices that his speed has increased. Nevertheless, Tanjiro observes that Akaza quickly adapted to Giyu's speed. Then Akaza embarrasses Demon Slayer Mark Giyu when he breaks the Hashira's sword by punching it. Giyu only survives because selfless state Tanjiro steps in, who is now noticeably stronger than Giyu in this fight. Akaza uses his strongest attack, Final Form Blue Silver Chaotic Afterglow, and while Tanjiro handles it fine with his new power-up, Giyu tries using Dead Calm and it fails miserably. Giyu says the attack was inescapable. Akaza hit him with a hundred blows almost all at once. He couldn't block them all, even with dead calm. And then Tanjiro is the one who takes Akaza's head after telling Akaza he'd do it ahead of time. Giyu contributes a bit by throwing his broken sword at Akaza's head so he can't hold it to his neck. Then he fights the headless body, trying his best to protect a now passed out Tanjiro. Just as an exhausted Giyu is about to reach his limit, Tanjiro wakes up and is the one who gets Giyu out of harm's way, as Akaza self-destructs. So while Akaza could have beaten both of them if he didn't self-destruct because they were at their limits, Tanjiro was definitely the more impressive one in this fight compared to Giyu. Still, Giyu is no slouch, and he even goes on to help during the fight against Muzan. And as mentioned, he lasts longer than Mitsuri along with Sanami, Gyome, and Iguro. During that battle, his blade turns red as well, signifying another Demon Slayer power-up. However, despite this, eventually he gets taken out of commission, temporarily by Muzan, and it even happened to the strongest Hashira, Gyome, so it's to be expected. Despite having lost a hand, Giyu eventually gets back up and helps Tanjiro keep Muzan pinned with his remaining arm. So Muzan can't run away from the sun, and this scene definitely reminds me of a father-son Kamehameha, the way the mangaka illustrated it. Giyu is one of the few Hashira to survive after Muzan's defeated. He participates in the fight against Demon King Tanjiro and survives that too. In the end, during chapter 204, we see him united with Sakonji, Nezuko, and Tanjiro again, and we even see a rare smile on his face. Fun fact, he also becomes friends with Tengen and is even allowed to hold Tengen's baby when it's born. Notably, Giyu also has a descendant called Tomioka Giichi that we see in the final time skip chapter, so despite how reserved and quiet Giyu is, it seems he did find a wife eventually. And unfortunately for the Giyu ex Shinobu shippers, it couldn't have been the late in Insect Hashira. Next, we have the 14 year old prodigy and descendant of the overpowered Tsukikuni family that produced strongest slayer ever, Yorichi, and strongest upper moon, Kokushibo. Of course, I speak of Miss Hashira Muichiro, one of the Hashira stars of the current anime season. We just recently saw how he awakened his memories and got the Demon Slayer power up. Then he used it to absolutely destroy Upper Moon 5 Gyoko's ultimate form that was supposed to be harder to cut through than diamonds. Tengen singled out Muichiro along with Gyome for being especially talented, so it's not surprising that he ended up being only one of two characters to ever solo an Upper Moon, the other being Zenitsu, who beat an Upper Moon 6 who was brought in as a replacement. Yes, you can say Muichiro got some help, but that was before he awakened his Demon Slayer Mark. After he awakened his Demon Slayer Mark, not only did he not need help, 
he even managed to completely outclass Final Form Gyoko while being heavily poisoned. This match didn't push Tokito to his limit, but his next important one did. Muichiro participated in the fight against his ancestor, the strongest upper moon Kokushibo. After praising Muichiro, Kokushibo draws his sword. And since it's the first time any of our characters saw his blood demon art, it's not that surprising that Muichiro loses his hand. What is impressive though is that he doesn't bat an eye. The 14 year old just stops the bleeding and immediately rushes in to attack again. Kokushibo even remarks how incredible it is. Obviously though, he's no match for Kokushibo by himself and Kokushibo quickly pins him down with his sword, planning to turn him into a demon. Sanami shows up and is not surprised Tokito was defeated. He says the shape of Kokushibo's attacks don't have fixed forms. They get distorted making them impossible to predict. Sanami says he couldn't have survived himself if his senses hadn't been honed from long experience. So it's implied that that's why Muichiro did worse than Sanami initially. The lack of experience which makes sense since he's only 14 compared to Sanami's 21. Although Sanami and Gyomei are present fighting Kokushibo, Muichiro still has more to offer. He pulls out the sword and even though he's in pain and knows he'll die from blood loss in a few hours, he prepares to help out as best as he can. As he says, if I'm going to die, I should do something useful first. And oh boy is he ever useful. Muichiro saves Genya, then Sanami, and then with his remaining arm manages to get to Kokushibo and to stab him with his sword. At this point, we see that Muichiro has awakened the transparent world power-up, just as Gyomei did during the middle of the fight. After Kokushibo takes off the lower half of Muichiro, Muichiro still remains holding his sword. And not just that, he even turns it bright red. Another important power-up. This limits Kokushibo's movements as he comments that it feels like his insides are on fire. And this, along with Genya's blood demon art and Gyomei and Sanami's skills, allows them to finally take Kokushibo's head. After the fight, Muichiro passes away, but Gyomei even says it's thanks to Muichiro that they were able to win. He even comments that for one so young, Muichiro really was magnificent to the end. In the afterlife, Muichiro tells his twin that he doesn't regret risking his life for his comrades. So yes, he did meet his end against the strongest upper moon, but also played a vital role in his defeat, and managed to shine even next to two of the strongest Hashira, Demon Slayer Mark Sanami and Gyome. We can only imagine how strong he would have become if, like Sanami and Gyome, he made it to his 20s. Next up, we have Sanami the Wind Hashira. This dude obviously also participated in the upper moon one fight, and as I mentioned, it's commented on how he does even better than Muichiro because of his longer experience. Kokushibo himself hypes up Sanami by thinking to himself that against the Hashira he's encountered so far, the contest would already be over. With such a statement, he puts Sanami above all the Hashira he's fought against in his very long demon life. We see he's insanely durable aka unkillable. By keeping his muscles flexed, he can stop his guts from spelling out when they should. Something that Kokushibo states a human shouldn't be able to do. He also has Marechi in his blood, which makes demons feel drunk and thus makes them easier to fight. However, as we saw, this wasn't a big factor in a fight against top tier demons like Kokushibo and Muzan. Another notable aspect is his wild fighting style. There are multiple instances where you're like, wow, no other Hashira would have pulled out a trick like that. In one case, he blocks Kokushibo's sword with a gun and then fires it. Sometimes he uses his foot to hold a sword, and so on. But anyways, back to the fight, Gyomei joins the fight and both of them awaken a Demon Slayer mark. Another notable thing is that Sanami works well with Gyomei. As Kokushibo says, in a battle of this speed, they cooperate. And Sanami mentions it's a good thing that the two of them train together. Being the strongest Hashira's training partner is definitely high praise. Kokushibo even thinks to himself that Sanami and Gyomei are highly skilled even among the Hashira. Albeit, he does single out Gyomei for being especially skilled, but still no one expected Sanami to be on Gyomei's level. Kokushibo concludes he'll go after the weaker link, but it's not that easy. Sanami quickly turns his sword when Kokushibo tries to attack and break it from the side. Kokushibo notes that Sanami's reflexes are getting even faster. He's becoming faster and more accurate as the fight goes on. Still, he never gets to Gyomei level, and his arms are only spared after a surprise Kokushibo attack because Gyomei used his chain to alter the angle of the attack. As a result, Sanami only loses some fingers. He is then almost taken out again, but Muichiro saves him this time. Sanami keeps fighting and along with Gyomei manages to avoid a mortal blow when Kokushibo sends out countless crescent blade attacks. Muichiro and Genya aren't that lucky, but notably Muichiro's time was already numbered and he, unlike Sanami, couldn't let go of the sword he was holding inside of Kokushibo because it was one of the keys to victory. Sanami and Gyomei relentlessly attack and it's Sanami's sword that presses down on Gyomei's weapon that turns them red and finally 
finally allows them to take Kokushibo's head. So Sanemi definitely played a key role here. When a headless Kokushibo refuses to go down, Sanemi and Gyome keep the pressure on with their incessant attacks. Kokushibo can't believe how no matter how much he cuts Sanemi, he won't bleed to death. Eventually, they win. Not only do Sanami and Gyome survive, Gyome notices that Sanami was fighting unconsciously at the end there. He finally comes to and doesn't even get to properly mourn his little brother Genya because as Gyome says, this fight isn't over until they defeat Muzan. Sanami joins the final battle by cutting up Muzan and then setting him on fire. Maybe it doesn't accomplish much, but it looks cool and again it's creative. It's hard to find another Hasha that thinks to throw bottles at Muzan and then to use the contents of those bottles to set Muzan on fire with a match. And all of that in the middle of battle. He does all of this between using his sword like a normal swordsman. He keeps fighting and is still fighting with the other skilled Hashira when Mitsuri is taken down. Sanami notably is still fighting when Giyu briefly loses his sword and Sanami tells him to stop spacing out or he'll kill him. Sanami takes damage from Muzan like the others and gets back up later to help Tanjiro once he's pinned Muzan. He then attacks giant baby Muzan as well and eventually through a collected effort they prevail. More Hashira present die than survive, but Sanami along with Giyu is one of the ones who somehow survives. Despite the fact that Kokushibo said most would have died early into the fight against him. And Sanami went on to fight Muzan later too and still somehow survives. No small feat. At the end of the series, after all he's been through, the dude is still in better shape than Tengen after his fight against Upper Moon 6, where the latter lost a hand and an eye. Sanami just lost some fingers as we saw. He proves to be one of the hardest to kill of all Hashira, and it's nice to see that at the end he makes amends with Nezuko, who he was especially cruel to in the beginning, and he's sorry for it. Next up is the serpent Hashira Iguro. This may not be obvious from the anime, but in the fan books, it's revealed that these two, meaning Sanami and Iguro, are actually really good friends and get along well. So it's not surprising that when Sanami was mean to Nezuko, in the beginning, Iguro was too, pointing out that they need to tempt her with blood in a dark room since she she can't come out into the sun. Iguro, like Sanami, doesn't come off as a nice guy at first, but the more you get to know them, the more you get to like them. As mentioned, Iguro was saved from a female serpent demon by Shinjuro Rengoku. He then went on to become a Hashira, and despite being one of the smallest and weakest Hashira physically, he is among the strongest Hashira all around. In other words, he makes up for his lack of size and raw power with his speed and skill as a swordsman. He's just hyped up for a long time and doesn't participate in any fights on screen. He chastises Tengen for losing a hand and an eye to beat a mere Upper Moon 6, not even knowing that Tengen had a bunch of help too from Tanjo and the others. In this way, he implies that he could have taken Upper Moon 6 by himself without getting serious injuries. There's also the fact that the mangaka saves his fighting for last, which is usually what they do with stronger characters in shonen series. Besides his strength though, which we'll get to soon, perhaps even more importantly is his relationship with Mitsuri. As mentioned, he gifted her the green socks she wears all the time. They regularly eat out together, enjoying each other's company, although Mitsuri always eats more than Iguro. They both love each other, but they both have inferiority complexes, and for Iguro's part, it's because his family got ahead by making immoral deals with a serpent demon, and because his own escape from that demon led to all of their deaths. He feels like his blood is filthy because of all this. And the only way to purify his blood in his view and to become worthy of Mitsuri is for him to die beating Muzan and to be reborn again in a new life, where he can then marry Mitsuri's reincarnation. And as mentioned during Mitsuri's part, he does get this happy ending in the future and I cannot be happier about it. So now, let's see what he did in the series to earn that happy ending in the next life. Iguro and Mitsuri first take on Upper Moon for Nakime. She's not that strong, but she is tricky. One can argue that she was just brought in to fill empty positions and doesn't even deserve to be an Upper Moon. And offensively speaking, I'd agree with that. But like I said, she's so tricky that the two Hashira, Iguro and Mitsuri, have trouble getting to her, even if she has no more luck being able to finish them off or hurt them. Iguro is clearly the more skilled of the two and helps Mitsuri when she needs it. During the fight, Mitsuri's clothes get all beaten up against Nakime, while Iguro's don't, which is a little clue to you that Iguro is actually the more skilled and on top of everything. Eventually, the two with Yushiro manage to get the better of Nakime without taking any notable damage. Iguro only gets to show what he's really got against the strongest demon Muzan, and his performance is one of the best during this final battle. As mentioned, Iguro is keeping up with Gyome, Giyu, Sanami, and Mitsuri against Muzan. Keep in mind, Iguro is the only one here who hasn't yet awakened his Demon Slayer Mark power, and yet he's doing just as well as the others, and in some cases better, as we saw when Mitsuri got brought down. 
At one point, Iguro even says that he can no longer shield Himejima, which is an insane flex of a comment. Not only was he doing better than Mitsuri, who was just trying to survive, he even had enough skill to worry about shielding someone else in addition to himself, let alone the fact that that person was the strongest Hashira. And I emphasize, when we start this fight, we seem to have a non-Demon Slayer Mark Iguro, while all of the others already have that insane power-up. Obviously, Gyomei is acknowledged as the strongest, but I think it's arguable that Iguro is the second strongest because of his feats in this battle. Not saying it's undeniable or anything, but I believe the case can be made based on all of the facts discussed so far and the facts that will be discussed moving forward. Sanami taking second spot is also a common argument among fans and in their defense, Sanami did fight Upper Moon 1 before this and even survives this fight while Iguro does not. So I'll let you guys comment on who's the strongest between these two below. Moving forward, Giyu, as mentioned, loses his sword to Muzan temporarily and questions his ability to keep going. Iguro steps in to help him until he bounces back. So then we see Iguro awakens his Demon Slayer Mark and turns his own blade red, while most had to get help from others to get their red swords. It took a lot out of him though and he nearly fainted, so he had to be saved from Muzan's attack in that moment. He then gets a great attack in on Muzan and Sanami notices that even Muzan takes time to regenerate after being cut by a red blade. Iguro keeps doing well and even gains access to the transparent world, something Tanjo gained access to before he beat Akaza and that Gyome gained access to during the Upper Moon 1 fight. It's a very top tier power up. Unfortunately, Muzan still manages to knock out everyone after a while. Notably, Iguro is the first to recover and jump in to save Tanjiro. Despite getting so injured that he can no longer see, he keeps fighting by having his snake friend Kaburamaru help him out. When Muzan tries to run, Iguro is the one who catches up and stabs him from above. Then, when Tanjiro finally pins Muzan, Iguro throws himself in front of Tanjiro to save him from Muzan's attack. So multiple times, the guy Shinjuro saved, saved Tanjiro, the most important person in beating Muzan. So again, shows how Shinjuro's good deeds did make the biggest difference in direct contrast to his previous beliefs that non-sun breathers shouldn't try because they can't make any meaningful difference. Even after taking the insane point blank attack from Muzan, Iguro keeps attacking giant baby Muzan along with the others, and eventually Muzan evaporates in the sun. They all succeeded and Iguro was arguably one of the most impressive, but perhaps because he was one of the most impressive, he received fatal injuries in the process. Before he goes though, he does have enough energy to go and comfort Mitsuri, who is also dying. They confess their love to each other in one of my favorite moments in the series and agree to get married in their reincarnated life. And thankfully they do as mentioned in the Mitsuri section. Next is the strongest Hashira Gyomei Himejima, the stone Hashira. He is a gentle giant when not kicking butt and is regularly seen crying. But don't let the tears fool you, this 27 year old deserves his title as the strongest Hashira. He has a special weapon, a Nichiren chain spiked flail and axe. The purity of the weapon is so high that Upper Moon 1 Kokushibo can't cut through the chain. We saw that Kokushibo placed Gyomei as an especially gifted Hashira, noticeably above Sanami, a skilled Hashira in his own right. Kokushibo comments that Gyomei is an example of the perfect physical form developed to the utmost. He thinks it's been perhaps 300 years since he set his eyes on such a great swordsman. Kokushibo straight up calls Gyomei's ability to wield such a heavy weapon as an extension of his body with so much lightness and agility unbelievable. Gyomei even succeeds in breaking Kokushibo's sword, but it's made of his flesh so he can easily regenerate it. He does all this before even activating the Demon Slayer Mark power-up. When cooperating with Sanami, Gyomei manages to take off Kokushibo's ear. Keep in mind that Kokushibo always wanted to be the strongest samurai, keyword samurai, and the fact that he got his sword broken and ear cut off is chipping away at that image of a samurai. Eventually, when he becomes all monster and casts off all pretense of being an honorable samurai, that's when he starts evaporating. But more on that in a bit, we're not there yet. We went over how Gyomei saved Sanami's arm when Kokushibo unleashed an unhonorable surprise attack by making his sword grow longer. Again, something that a samurai wouldn't be able to rely upon. Every time Kokushibo strays from the path of a samurai in his fight, it's like a little victory for our side, and these little victories add up in the end. During the battle, Gyomei gets a further prestigious power-up, access to the transparent world, and he uses this power-up and knowledge strategically to win the battle. Within the high-paced battle, it's a rosary ball from Gyomei that hits into Kokushibo's hand with enough force that changes everything. Because the rosary dulled his attack in that moment, everyone was able to land a meaningful attack, especially Muichiro. It's at this point that Upper Moon 1 points out that because Gyomei was able to sense the transparent world, he was able to control his own blood circulation and 
that's what disturbed Kokushibo's attack. Obviously, this opened up the window for everyone to gang up on Kokushibo, including Genya with his OP Blood Demon Art Wujutsu powers. Gyomi, along with Sanami, avoids taking lethal damage from another desperate surprise attack from Kokushibo, where swords sprout from all over his body. And finally, it is Gyomi's giant spiked ball, which turns red after Sanami uses his sword to add force to it that takes off Kokushibo's head. Here the fight if Kokushibo was a non-demon samurai would be more than over already. Even if he was most demons it would be over. But like Musan and Akaza, Kokushibo appears to be powerful enough to regrow his head, even while Gyome and Sanami are attacking the body without rest. But now he looks nothing like a samurai and completely like a monster. In these cases where the head grows back, as we saw with Akaza, the upper moon usually needs to psychologically give up to stop regenerating. And this happens when Kokushibo sees his monstrous reflection in Sanami's sword. He's shocked and says, referring to himself, What is this? It's so ugly. He asks himself, Is this how a samurai looks? He questions if this is really what he wanted, and then after he starts to question himself, his body starts dissolving from where Muichiro stabbed him. He talks about the ugliness of not admitting defeat, even though they took off his head, and of living in disgrace and becoming a monster, all because he was so scared of defeat. He says he became a miserable creature before he completely disappears. Now all this time, Gyome and Sanami were pressing Kokushibo to the point where Sanami had passed out and was fighting unconsciously and had to be told by Gyome when to stop. Then Gyome is the one who reminds Sanami once he comes to that it's not over until they beat Muzan. So after all that, Gyome didn't faint like Sanami and is ready to keep on fighting immediately and he does help during the final battle, even receiving fatal injuries in the battle. However, he doesn't shine as much as Igoro in the final battle as I talked about, and that's probably because Gyome shines so much during the Upper Moon 1 fight, and the Magaka needs some time to develop Igoro and give him his moment as well. And we gotta be fair, Igoro fought a tricky but not that dangerous Nakime for a bit, which you can compare to Gyome's fight against the strongest Upper Moon. So Igoro was coming into his final battle a lot fresher. Nevertheless, Gyome was great and contributed to defeating Muzan. Even continuing to fight and help stop giant baby Muzan after losing a leg. Now you may have gotten a sense of the way I'd rank the Hasha while explaining them, so let's enter the ranking portion of the video. We do know that this is an especially strong generation of Hashira, and so this would make me want to put Jigoro, Urokodaki, and Shinjuro in the bottom tier. Yes, we have some cool feats from Shinjuro, specifically like saving Igoro from a serpent lady demon, and for embarrassing a demon that would go on to become a demon moon while drunk, but the fact remains we haven't seen any of them take on demon moons on screen, so can't make crazy cases for their power. We then have Kanae, Shinobu, and Tengen, who didn't awaken Demon Slayer marks and didn't come off as especially strong among the current generation. Doma did say that Shinobu wasn't as strong as her sister, which is one of the reasons Kanae is in this tier, but I also think Shinobu should be given credit. Her goal was to make sure Doma eats her and ingests the poison within her, and she accomplished that after being pretty impressive in the fight, especially speed-wise. She's still in this tier to me because even if she was physically too weak to cut off a demon's head, I think her speed and poisons made up for it to an extent, and although it took sacrificing her life, she did play a key role in taking down Upper Moon 2, something Kanae couldn't even do. Next, Mitsuri should probably be put here in her own tier. She did awaken a Demon Slayer mark and held her own for a very long time against Upper Moon 4 Hantengu's strongest form, Zohakuten, who wasn't toying around either. She went on to help against Nakime and then even against Muzan. She just couldn't keep up with the other skilled Hashira against Muzan. Then we got a broader tier here in which I'd put Giyu, Rengoku, and Muichiro. Muichiro is one of the most naturally gifted Hashira, and I mean the dude soloed an Upper Moon at 14 years old, and yeah, he could have easily made it to the top tier, but he just lacked experience. As we saw, that lack of experience did come into play as Sanami pointed out when it came to a super strong opponent like Upper Moon 1. Perhaps it's weird I'm putting a character who didn't awaken a Demon Slayer mark here, but he's the mentor of Mitsuri and he did amazingly well one-on-one -on -one against Akaza. So I have to personally put Rengoku here as well. I just couldn't put him any lower. Giyu, for his part, is not higher up in my view because despite awakening a Demon Slayer mark, he wasn't that impressive in the Akaza fight and completely took a backseat to Tanjiro. In the Muzan fight, he dropped his sword first among the remaining highly skilled Hashira, while the others had to step in to save him and give him a pep talk. Now again, I'm not saying you can't argue that Giyu could be in the top tier, I'm sure a lot of people would like to, but for me personally, I'd put him here based on what we've seen in the biggest battles. And now, the top tier of Hashira goes to Sanami, Iguro, and of course, Gyome at the pinnacle. 
for Sunami, I'm impressed by how he just doesn't die. The dude goes through so much damage, so many fights, impresses Upper Moon 1 by being able to fight him one on one for a while, even when most Hashira would have been dead by that point, as Kokushiwa points out. And the dude makes it to the end of the series in the best shape, no arm or leg missing. Iguro, like I said, didn't come from a hard fight like Upper Moon 1, but he did exceptional in the Muzan fight, being able to keep up with the best and even shield others, even before we see his power ups like Demon Slayer Mark and Red Sword and Axis of Transparent World and so on. He also gets up first after everyone faints and as a result helps Tanjiro the most out of any Hashira against Muzan. And then of course Gyomei is an easy one, he's acknowledged in the series and by the other Hashira as being number one and should maybe have his own tier as even Kokushibo said in black and white he was above Sanami. He unlocks the overpowered Transparent World power up as well and uses it to turn the tides of the Upper Moon 1 fight with a Rosary Ball. And after that continues to help stop Muzan right up to the end even when he's only got one leg remaining. And I stress it doesn't bother me if people rank them differently like in the comments for example, just explain your reasons if you got them. It all depends on how you make your argument. Now the Hasha were strong, I'll give you that, but the Demon Moons get even stronger. So if you enjoyed this one, you won't want to miss the companion video, all 18 Demon Moons explained and ranked on screen right now, and I'll see you there.